Hey guys, what's up? This is False Bulls123 and I am back in action. Now, before I start my September wrap up, I just wanted to discuss a few things. Mainly since it's been about a year since I started my YouTube channel, I started around mid-October, it's October, early October right now. I wanted to do a sort of special kind of segmented part video to sort of celebrate my one year anniversary. I figured I might as well just wrap it, like, you know, include it with my September wrap-up since it's going to be pretty short this month. I've been doing a lot of editing recently, so I haven't had a lot of time to read. And so here's how the format of this video is going to go. First section, we're going to discuss the books I read this month. It's only four. I know it's not that much. Once again, I've been busy. Sorry. Second up, I'm going to be discussing kind of my year of YouTubing, what I've enjoyed, what I've been doing, and any sort of personal growth I've seen in myself. And three, we'll be discussing my, I guess, future upload schedule both in the recent months since I'm going to be doing some stuff and also in the future how I want to structure my channel. So since there's going to be a lot happening in this video, let's move on. First book I read was My Best Friend's Exorcism. Basically the story of a girl becoming possessed, going through all this shit, and it's set in the 80s during the Satanic Panic. Now if you're younger like me, you might not know what the Satanic Panic was. And that's basically is that in the 80s, there was a lot of conspiracy theories, a lot of shit going down, where everyone was convinced that everything was the de devil trying to make your children into atheists or something. People thought that, you know, kindergartner teachers were teaching people how to save the Lord's Prayer backwards. People thought that D&D &D was going to make you have a psychotic break and murder your parents. People thought all sorts of crazy shit. Everything was from the devil. Oh. Tattoos are from the devil. Ah! Okay, that's what the Satanic Panic basically was. It's pretty much our obsession with Crayonon today is a similar moral outrage panic. It's the same type of thing, you know? Just people being like, if you get a tattoo, you're going to start doing crack and worshipping Satan. That's just what people thought, you know? And better or worse, that is just a product of the time period. So, basically, it's pretty kind of dry, the actual plot person get, starts getting possessed and from that standpoint the plot is a standard possession story you know you're all good and chill then you get a demon up in you then you start doing bad shit then you get exercised and so obviously an exorcism story has a natural progression which happens in the book but I think the story is actually well flavored with a lot of the element and the discussion and the things that actually happen within it because as I like to say over and over again it's not the themes it's the execution so let's talk about what's really interesting and unique about the story. First of, all, it, first of all is the period setting. Obviously the Satanic Panic plays a really big part into the story as well as like you know themes of Catholicism since they go to a Catholic school. So the idea is really prevalent. But I think what is also really interesting is how specifically Hendrix used a lot of the bad aspects of the period. We tend to romanticize period in historical fiction, and so it's definitely very refreshing to read a historical fiction or a period piece which actually incorporates negative aspects like racism, homophobia, and classism. So for instance, in, with homophobia, which it wasn't particularly understated, I don't remember there being any LGBT characters in the book, that being said, there were some instances in which the characters would say homophobic things or use the term queer as a pejorative, and that was not, like, you know, chill. But at the same time, it was being used for effect to denotate the effects of homophobia in society. Same thing with aspects of racism. Some of the characters would say some racist shit. Very innocuous, not directed at any particular person, but just very insular racism that was very casual. And so while I understood that it wasn't Hendrix's belief or bias in the book, I did recognize that he included these aspects to show that these biases existed during the time period, which I thought was really, really effective. There's also discussions of, let's see, eating disorders, of sexual assault, which while not directly shown, well, actually trigger warning, there is some usage of eating disorders as a theme in this book. So if you are sensitive to that, please be advised that it is in this book. It's pretty fucked up, just to let you know in that regards. Sorry to spoil it, but I need to let you know that that is something that happens. Anyway, so they mentioned these things, and they also really discuss sort of society's 
reaction to these events that happened. And let's be honest, it was not a chill beans reaction. It was not cash money. How bitches was reacting to shit like this. And I think that the sort of vices and the problems of 80s culture was really one of the subtext of the horror of the novel. How all these sort of shitty reactions to things like women's anatomy, not women's anatomy, women's autonomy, or other aspects like that were really reflected and it was used as sort of a club to really get into sense just how shitty the situation was. So I guess societal horror, if that's a thing, was one of the aspects of this novel on top of the supernatural horror of just having a demon all up at you, you know? So I really like that aspect of it. So I think I really mentioned in a roundabout way all the things I enjoyed about it. Basically the discussions of class, the discussions, uh, the usage of racist, racism and homophobia as a way of underlying like societal like, you know, prejudice. And also the use of, actually no, I didn't mention it. They also was used a lot of 80s pop culture, which makes sense given the time period. And so it was a lot less sanitized than your sort of Stranger Things type show. But it also was very set in 80s nostalgia. So if you really want a kind of 80s nostalgia type horror novel that deals with some of the issues of 80s culture and also you like exorcism books, that this is a pretty good pick. I gave it 4 out of 5 stars. I'm getting long winded here so let's move on. Next up I read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Which actually I wanted to just state that I thought it was a poetry book and it was in fact a autobiography. Very different. I was listening to it and I'm thinking, wow, this is some really weird sounding poetry, but then I realized it was prose. Moving on, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings follows Maya Angelou's life from her early childhood in Sam's, Arkansas to the birth of her first child. It deals with a lot of different aspects of her life, living with her mother, let's see, her first jobs, and a lot of other aspects. And it also discusses a lot of the racism and prejudice she experienced in her early childhood. There's some other aspects of her life that were really, really unsavory and messed up. And so I do want to put a trigger warning, trigger warning in this. The sexual assault does play a very heavy role in a couple of the chapters. And I just want you to know that that is in there. And it is terrible and horrible. And so if you do not want to experience that experience, then do not. So anyway. So one of the things I liked was her voice. She had was very well read, so she had a very eloquent way of speaking, but she was also very stochastic and acerbic at times. Someone would be talking and she would be clapping back and you were just like, yes, queen, get it. And so I really enjoyed the way she described things, the way she saw the world. And I also really enjoyed the way she was thinking about things as like, you know, a kid and how she viewed the world. Cause there's a lot of things she would say that really stuck with me. Just how, I guess, like, you know, one thing in particular was a lot of the things she would say from, like, you know, her childhood point of view was very much like an internalized racism that I had never really considered. One thing that immediately stuck with me was her describing God as white. Hey, this is Future Ryan, and the next part of this video, I get just so in-depth into a large discussion about whether or not Jesus is white or black and it's from a very specific Judeo-Christian viewpoint and I realized that the entire thing was kind of tangential to the actual review of the book. However, I thought I had some interesting points to make about it and I really did enjoy the discussion. So I left that part in just mostly like it's one way just to have that conversation as another point to practice my editing skills. But if you really don't give a shit, like if you're from a different religious background or you just really don't care about, I guess, religious analysis in autobiographical memoirs, then I'm going to be putting a timestamp on screen that you can click on, try to put it in the description, and you can just skip to like the part where I stop talking about Black Jesus. But if you think that might be something interesting to watch, go ahead and like, you know, just keep watching because I'm going to get into it. Okay. Which I never really thought about before. And I know that everyone has like different religions or atheists. And but generally for me, I was raised very religiously. And 
you know, it is very accurate that often times in iconography, the Christian God is depicted as white. So is Jesus and so is a lot of like the other people, even though if we look at the Bible historically, there was a lot of black people. But we do tend to depict it as such. And I think it was just interesting reading it from that perspective that, yeah, from, I guess, historically a Western culture or Western religion, that is how the iconography would be depicted. And so for a African-American parishioner, they would have the idea of God being white. And I think that what really just stuck with me is that while I understood that, I'm kind of in modern day culture, there is this idea of like, you know, white Jesus or black Jesus and that whole debacle. I mean, white folks only want to hear the good shit. Life eternal, a place in God's heaven. But as soon as you hear that you're getting this good shit from a black Jesus, you're freaked. And that, my friends, is called hypocrisy. A black man can steal your stereo, but he can't be your savior. You need that hash brown? We just had a couple of notes. One or two. Nothing significant. Let's see, uh, there's a typo on page five, uh, there's a continuity problem on page 32. I think that scene's supposed to be at night. Um, let's see, um, oh yeah, um, and uh, Jesus can't be black. What do you mean he can't be black? He can't be black. Uh, maybe we could make Jesus another color. How about white? But Jesus was black. We could probably do Italian. Jesus was Middle Eastern. In addition to Arabs, the Middle East has always had many people of African descent whom you would consider black. Black Jesus hangs from the cross in a painting on the hallway wall, and Malcolm X holds a shotgun in a photograph next to him. Problem is, it would have taken Black Jesus to convince my parents to let me come. Now Black Jesus would have to save me if they found out I'm here. And so another aspect I really was thinking about when, like, you know, I heard that debacle was um, one of the short stories in the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. So the story in question is called The Fire Balloons. It was written by Ray Bradbury in the 1960s and then was collected in The Illustrated Man and later in the Martian Chronicles, which is where I read it. The main plot of the story follows Christian missionaries on a mission to Mars in which they discover a ancient race of Martians and much of the story is discussing essentially whether or not they can evangelize to said Martians who are depicted as essentially globes of light. And in this quote that I have chosen specifically, the discussion is whether or not they can depict Jesus as a circle. Essentially, they are reducing the imagery and, I guess, ideas of Christianity to simple geometry as a metaphor to explain it to the Martians who are orbs. So in this quote specifically, Father Peregrine is discussing how different cultures and different ethnicities on earth change aspects of the Messiah, of Jesus of Nazareth, to match their own lived experiences and appearance. Now, I would like to say before I quote this that this was written in a different time, and so the words used to describe different ethnicities are definitely different and might not be acceptable in today's setting. Also, I cannot back up any of the claims or stereotypes that Bradbury presents in this story, but I would like to state that the quote is meant to illustrate the idea of people shaping the idea of iconography into their own image so that it represents them. Consider the Chinese, replied Father Peregrine imperturbably. What sort of Christ do Christian Chinese worship? An Oriental Christ, naturally. Y'all seen Oriental nativity scenes. How is Christ dressed in Eastern robes? Where does he walk? In Chinese settings of bamboo and misty mountains and crooked trees. His eyelids taper, his cheekbones rise. Each country, each race adds something to our Lord. I am reminded of the Virgin of Guadalupe, to whom all Mexico pays its love. Her skin? Have you noticed the paintings of her? A dark skin like that of her worshippers. Is this blasphemy? Not at all. It is not logical that men should accept a god, no matter how real, of another color. I often wonder why our missionaries do well in Africa, with a snow-white Christ. Perhaps because white is a sacred color in albino or any other form to the African tribes. 
Given time, mightn't Christ darken there too? The form does not matter. Content is everything. We cannot expect these Martians to accept an alien form. We shall give them Christ in their own image. And so, to me, like, you know, that was kind of part and parcel for how religion is interpreted, that you have these religious figures, but they're a representation of the human rather than the human being representation of the person, of the God. I hope that makes sense. But, but So even while Christian faith dictates that God's that humans are created in God's image, we tend to see God represented as what we look like, specifically as our aspect of humanity, rather than a single note, a single idealized aspect of humanity, if that makes sense. <laughs> Anyway, to make a long story short, the main point is that I found it really fascinating how, at least for Maya Angelou, when beginning her childhood, seeing this religious figure, seeing this literal god as being other from herself on the basis of race was really impactful because while I see iconography and I can instantly relate, for someone who is African American or for someone who is not white, seeing that having that be the integral idea of what holiness or piousness is, is really disconcerting. And so while spiritually I would be, I believe that God is like, you know, pan-gendered and pan-racial because of scripture, I realized that like, you know, a African American woman or any person of color would not be able to have that same ability to relate. And so actually having that stated, even though it wasn't a main point in the book, was I just think really impactful. And there were other elements like that in the book where she would say something and you would recognize it as, you know, racism, but racism directed one towards oneself by the culture and society that they grew up in. And so I think actually having those moments of very clear cut internalized racism was a very impactful part of the book or autobiography rather. I don't really know how much else I can what much else I can get into the book with considering it is an autobiography and so a lot of the stuff that I could tell you would be spoilers I guess but basically the book is there's a lot of dark and fucked up shit that's happened in her life but there's also like you know more positive moments that occurred in her life like during this time period and so I think that if you're looking for a good autobiography and you definitely want to read something by an African-American author that deals with their lived experiences, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings is definitely something that you should read. On a lighter note, I read two other books during the time period, and so I'm just going to get into them real quick. So next up is Midnight Blue Light Special by Shauna McGuire, and this follows Rarity Price, who is a ballroom dancing cryptozoologist. Which basically means she's like a social worker slash bounty hunter for cryptids, which in this case really mean mythical creatures. So you have things like dragons, boogeymen, and also other, let's see, myths and folklore traditions. I believe um, there was also Tanukis and Wahilis, or Wahilas, which were a Canadian folklore, which I thought was really interesting. And so the way that she actually uses cryptids and folklore as a way of actually including diversity in a fantasy setting was just, bitch, we love to see it. Fantasy has a really bad issue with whitewashing. And so reading a book where many, many of the characters are people of color, I'm just like, damn, Goyle, get it. Another thing I really enjoyed about the book was the characters. But before I get into that, I actually need to give you a bit more information about the plot. Basically, what's happening in this book is that Verity Price is kind of having an internal debate on whether or not she wants to become a ball wants to continue her career in ballroom dancing or become a cryptozoologist full time, which is her family's profession. On top of that, her boyfriend, who's kind of secretly like, you know, part of the bad you know, evil Catholic cult that wants to murder all the monsters and this super monster racist. And so his boss is coming to town and he's like, hey, babe, sorry to do this to you, but my bosses are coming and they're probably going to commit genocide against all of these, like, you know, innocent species that just want to 
you know, live, and it's not their fault that they have, like, half of a snake's body for a body, you know? And she's like, well, this sucks. And so it's basically one half of her trying to fight, what was it called, the Covenant of St. George. I remember, I always wanted to say St. John, but it's the Covenant of St. George. And so she's fighting them, and on the other hand, she's dealing with a lot of personal issues at the same time. The things I really liked was... As I mentioned before, the characters, all of her characters are very fleshed out, and there's a lot of really fun, interesting characters in the story. One, let's see, two that I really liked, besides obviously the main characters, was on Sarah, which is her cousin, who is a psychic cryptid called a cuckoo. And basically, cuckoos are named after the bird, which, if you don't know what a cuckoo is, basically is a bird that's like, yo, I see you got some eggs there. What if I shoved your egg out of your nest and popped my egg in and boom, honey, free baby? And so cuckoos are a parasitic bird, right? Crypt, the cryptid is the same way. They basically pop the child out. The p baby's like, yo, um, I'm supposed to be here because I'm using my psychic, like, mind abilities to Jedi mind trick fuck you. And so that's basically how they operate. And Sarah has actually been raised by a mostly human family. And so in that case, she's actually had nurturing, which has prevented her from being a literal spree killer. So that's nice. <sighs> Another character I really enjoyed was Istas, who is a Lahila. And I'm not sure about the exact mythology, but I do know it is from Canada, which I thought was really interesting. Another part that I really enjoyed about her character, besides the fact that she's just like, yo, let's fuck some shit up, was that she was really into gothic Lolita. So I just really loved imagining a... First Nations, like, Canadian woman just dressed up like a Victorian doll while, like, absolutely slaughtering people. Not that she does it in the book, but you know, she li she wants to. She's she's ready to party, if you know what I mean. And I just, like, that mental image was just fantastic. So there are a lot of really enjoyable characters. And as a book goes, while it does have its serious moments, it also was pretty lighthearted and fun to read. So, I was not expecting much from Midnight Blue Light Special, but I actually had a really great time with this book. So, I'll probably check out the rest of the books in the series, and I'll probably check out Sean and McGuire in the future, because this was a good time. And I'm actually really glad that I just picked this up on the web. So, this is the only book I reread, and that was All Stein's Halloween Party. I also want to mention that this is part of the Fear Street Collection, or series, whatever you want to call it. And that was Allstein's teen horror series. I like to mention that because Allstein has actually written several different horror series. And they're all directed towards different age groups. So he's written young adult, but he's also written tween and, I guess, middle grade horror novels. And so I like to mention that because if you have, like, one idea of Allstein, you might be getting the wrong impression from his books. So, this is actually one of my favorite Fear Street Collection novels, though I have read quite a few of them. And it basically follows Terry and Nikki. They are a high school couple, and they get invited to a fun party for Halloween at this creepy mansion called Cameron Manor. And they're like, yes, let's get it. But Nikki is like, you know, the chick that invited us is kind of sus, and she's kind of been flirting with you, and I don't deal with no hoe. And he's like, honey, don't worry about it. While you're being suspicious of, like, the lady who invited us to a big fancy party, I'm going to go have a big hot gay bromance with my ex-best friend because we started dating you and apparently we're the opposite of the Bechdel test because that's the only thing we talk about. <laughs> And so that basically sets up the main conflict between the characters. Another thing I really wanted to mention is that Nikki, the girlfriend, is deaf. Or at least she is hard of hearing. I don't believe she... It's said that she is not completely deaf, but that she is mostly deaf. And we love to see that representation. Especially since in the horror, in this story, her disability actually comes to, a, to an advantage at one point. And I do love to see... Stories where blind or deaf characters have something about their condition that makes them very uniquely able to solve a situation. Because, damn, we love to see disability representation, especially in horror. But let's move on. Basically, the things I liked about this book was definitely the atmosphere, a lot of the sort of quirky, campy horror vibes that went into straight-up horror vibes and the ending. Some elements I didn't care for this book upon rereading was 
a lot of the drama, mostly just because as a teenager, I was really into the characters. I could like relate to this bullshit. But reading it now, I just am not as immersed into the character dynamics. A lot of it is, there is some really great elements, but there's also this really obnoxious fight between two of the characters, Terry and then his ex-best friend, Alex. And basically, Alex is mad at Terry because basically Nikki chose him chose Terry and not him and so they got this big beef over like the GF but throughout the entire thing they're constantly like sparring against each other and maybe it's just me as an adult but that shit seems really homoerotic and I know it's not but I just I see two bros like constantly talking about each other and like be and like, like you come at me bro and I'm just like shit sus you know and so they spend more time talking about each other than Terry actually like talking to his girlfriend half the time and can you two just stop fighting and also can the rest of you stop doing this whole jock nerd thing because it's passe i like the idea of like a horror competition but most of it is just really shitty trash talking and honestly i feel like you could have i'm not really sure how to get into it i just i feel like it have been could have been developed more I know that Al Stein doesn't tend to write really complex, deep characters because he wants the characters to be relatable and for you to be immersed into the story. And so Al Stein is really good at creating intense horror situations, but his characters are not really the highlights of his books. And so I feel like all of that drama was a bit unnecessary, even though it was some of the interest in the original part of the book. So that is my very warty description of a horror novel 20 years old. So I did pick, I did DNF one book during this time period, and that was The Last Widow by Karen Slaughter. I've never read Karen Slaughter before, though I've heard her mentioned many, many times by other booktubers. And I believe that she mostly does thrillers, which was what Last Widow was. So quick, like back of the book blurb was basically a CDC scientist gets kidnapped, and then there's an explosion in this, like, really busy area of, I think, D.C. or something. And so you get some, like, intrigue with that aspect. Mostly what I got in the first couple chapters I was reading before I put it down was a lot of domestic drama. And I wasn't really into it. For instance, in the first chapter where the kidnapping happens, and it's not a spoiler because it's literally listed on the black cover as the, as the blurb, the woman literally spends, I believe, several pages discussing whether or not her child should be wearing lip gloss. And she goes into it. She's like, you know, I don't think my child should be wearing makeup at this age. But then she's like, am I demonizing makeup and not allowing my daughter to like properly experience femininity and am I shaming femininity by not allowing this or is it simply like you know a matter of fact that she's too young to be expressing herself in this matter and then she's like but what about her friends am I like you know ostracizing her because of this and then she spends a several more paragraphs justifying like how she's going to deal with the blowout about letting her daughter buy a box thing of lip gloss by like you know shaming her girlfriend or fiance because i do believe it was a sapphic relationship about some sort of iphone they bought her and i'm thinking this is all well and good i mean it's well written but this is a tube of lip gloss i'm not sure if i really wanted to pick up a book just to listen to a woman discuss for several pages whether or not she should let her daughter buy lip gloss i'm not even joking that was literally the first chapter Oh, and then she gets kidnapped. And you're like, oh, okay, that happened. The next pair, of, the next chapters deal with somebody's mother telling enough, some woman that they should get married to their boyfriend. And she's like, you know, I'm not ready. And then she's like, what you doing for your life? If you're not married to someone, you're useless. That's why women are only here to have babies and get married. And you're like, okay, that's a bit aggressive. And then there's some like... You, and then there's some, you know, descriptions and some fleshing out the situation. And you're like, this is all well and good. But in the very next chapter, you see this entire, the entire scene from the man's perspective. And you're like, I do like to have multiple perspectives and scenes. But I just read this. I literally just read this, Karen Slaughter. And so, for the most part, I just wasn't really... 
immersed into the action and the thriller part of the story because there was just so much domestic drama happening. And maybe as a reader, I'm not that into domestic drama. I also found out that this book was several books into a series, so maybe I'm supposed to have a much more, I guess, emotional connection to the characters at this point, and I haven't because I haven't read the books. But for, like, you know, a lot of the reasons, just it wasn't entertaining me, I put it down. I want to be reading books that are really captivating for me, and actually that's a great segue into my next part of this series. So as I said earlier in this video, I'm about a year into my YouTube career. Just a little bit of statistics right now, I have 10 subscribers and about 100 videos. So if you're just watching this, so if this is the first video that you're watching on my channel, I have plenty more to check out, feel free to do that. For the most part, I think that some of the things that I have benefited from doing this channel is, so I think that it's important as a channel that I want to talk about some of the things that I've enjoyed and some of the things that I've had challenges with from this year in, I guess, vlogging, YouTubing, whatever you want to call it. So things I've enjoyed is definitely creating content. I found vlogging to be an incredibly enjoyable experience and I actually love thinking about like all sorts of fun things you can do with vlogs because I feel like a vlog, just like any creative hobby should be, should be an opportunity to do something that you really enjoy doing. And so I try to a lot, use my YouTube channel to push myself to try new things or experience more in life and have fun filming it too because I think filming it filming is also enjoyable. It gives an excitement to the situation you're in because you have to record it and there's things to say. I think another fun aspect is really the sense of accomplishment from finishing a video and being able to publish it and also by able to participating in community events like readathons. And so by doing stuff like that, I feel a lot more connected and that is a really enjoyable experience. I think some of the things that I've definitely gained in experience or grown as a person is First of all, obviously editing skills. I did not have those before I started YouTube. And so I've definitely learned how to edit videos and make really, really shitty thumbnails. So you're welcome, fam. I think another aspect that I'm definitely learning and constantly growing in, just like you would any other skill, I guess is screen presence, stage presence, whatever you would want to call it. When I first started YouTube, I felt like, I definitely think I felt a bit stilted. But as I do more and more videos, I think I become more comfortable in front of the camera. And I know that sometimes when I'm doing a video, I can be very upbeat, I can be very positive, but I also re realize that there are other videos like, I feel this one where I'm much more laid back and calm. And so I think another one challenge I definitely need to figure out as I go on is making sure that I have a consistent tone in video presentation. Other, let's see, I guess stumbling blocks for me is, I guess you'd say upload schedule is definitely sometimes an issue since that really makes me feel a lot of strain and so I need to find ways to combat that and to alleviate that strain. And also just editing can be a real bitch sometimes and that's just the gosh darn truth about it. But I think as you know I keep doing this YouTube channel I will have a lot of growth and a lot more learning on what to do. And while I'm not having I guess success or as much growth as I would like. I've been thinking a lot about my situation and I definitely enjoy YouTubing. And so I want to have use it as a vehicle for my own enjoyment rather than have this focus on this job, on this obligation, you know, allow myself to enjoy my activities instead of feeling pressured by them. And that actually brings us into a perfect segue for part three. So in light of that, I really did want to discuss sort of my plans and the future of my channel. Like I mentioned before, I'm going to be incorporating more booktube elements. You've already seen this, you're watching a wrap up video, duh. But at the same time, I also wanted to think about how I upload and that sort of time management strain that that puts on me, since it is a lot of effort to upload videos. And while I can, uh, and while at the moment I can, like, you know, frequently upload videos and do this, I also need to consider at moments of my life if I'm putting all of my time and energy into certain hobbies when I want to and can to pursue other ones. And so because of that, I think coming next year in 2021, 
I'm going to be following a different upload schedule. I will be having monthly wrap-ups, of course, and but for the most part, I will have maybe one or two videos a month. And what I want to do is essentially, when I have an idea, when I have something that I want to film, I'm going to film it, I'm going to edit it at my own leisure, and then I'm going to upload it. And that way I'll have individualized projects with still having that monthly update, but then I won't be overly stressed out if I can't be giving you a complete week-by-week -week video. And I know that I only have 10 subscribers, and so it's not going to be that big impact to your feed. But I like to be transparent about my comings and goings, because, you know, this is a brand, this is a identity, this is a account, and you have to be honest about these things. It's just like anything else you do. And so, by having, like, that sporadic upload system, I feel like I'm going to be able to actually make a lot of content that I want to do without being able to worry about time constraints or editing time because I can have a month long video and then I can spend a month editing and upload it and I don't have to feel like I'm failing someone or disappointing my viewers by not having it that expectation. And so I feel by changing the way I upload it's going to be a lot easier for me to upload and I can put more quality into the content I create because I'm not worried about having a once a week upload schedule. That being said, once I upload this video and I believe my newbie tag, because you know, this is kind of the start of my booktube, I guess the booktube era or something, I will be taking November off. First of all, it's my birthday, happy birthday me, but also I would just like some time to decompress from the constant production schedule that I've been putting myself through for the last year. I'm going to take this time to actually do some D&D &D writing because I try to DM and I want to start it next year. And so I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff like that. I'm also going to be doing Inktober this in October, so I'll post it on Instagram if you want to check that out. Though, by the time you watch this, I'll probably be like halfway through it, so yeah. The last two sections of this video were actually a lot shorter than I thought they were going to be, so that actually makes me pretty happy because... Like I said before, I've been trying to make shorter and shorter videos really condense what I've been saying. Hopefully that works. Anyway guys, I've had an absolutely wonderful time with you today. Let me know down below if you've read in the books that I read, what your thoughts are, all that jazz. And remember, tell you, wash your hands, tell your loved ones you love them, and live every day trying to be a better and better person. This is False Bulls 1239. You guessed it. Signing out.